you everybody so much. It is such an absolute pleasure to be here at the gathering and such a great honour to be a patron of an organisation that itself honours people in a really particular and very important way. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to spill the beans a little bit about how it how it all happened. So I've made slides and I need to be here to be able to see them. So if I if I sit so I can press the buttons, can we still see each other enough? Is that good enough? Um, one of the crazy things that happened after I wrote a book about dying was that I had to have photographs taken professionally. Um, I'm a girl who's very, very reluctant to have photographs taken. And uh, one of the uh, publishers uh, asked me if I could send a photograph. Could I send a headshot to the people in New York? So I clipped a headshot from a family photograph and I sent it to them. And they emailed me back and they said, this looks like you've clipped it from a family <laughs> photograph. <laughs> Uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, that, that is... And they said, well, we need professional quality photographs. And I said, well, I'm a retired doctor. I haven't got professional quality photographs. So I got a curt email that's saying, dear Dr Mannix, this is what people use the advance for. So this is um, <laughs> me, me and a photographer wandering around Newcastle University. So let me have a think about how all of this madness has happened. As some of you realise, I wrote a book. Um, I wrote a book really out of complete exasperation after 30 years in palliative care that we're still having the same conversation with each family of each person who's approaching the end of life. And everybody is terrified and everybody thinks dying is like Hollywood or EastEnders, or Choose Your Soap. And in fact, that there are very few good public references for normal dying, and because we don't see normal dying at home anymore, we've forgotten, we've forgotten the wisdom. And all I wanted to do was put it back out there in the same way that people used to know it, by watching it happen. So that's why it's stories, because what I hope is that what I'm saying is, come, come and sit here by me, and let's look together at this thing happening with this person, with this family, with these circumstances. So for those of you who, who have read it, you'll know that it's not clever, it's not academic, it's just actually two people chatting and I'm one of them. And that I hope that by asking questions rather than being very telly, it helps people to think about the things that are important to them. But because of that, because of the publicity that came out from writing that book, I got noticed by somebody called Hermione somebody. <laughs> um, and she set the gang on me. <laughs> um, so I got this very nice uh, approach to ask whether I would consider being a patron of the organisation. And so obviously patrons to me, that's... Uh, that's rock stars or royalty. And <laughs> since I'm neither of those, that made me slightly anxious. So I did a lot of homework, and the, the website was just developing at that stage. And I thought, well, they, they, they don't look too mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> let's, have, let's have a little thing. So I, I did a bit of homework. Um, but I've been a school governor, and I've been um, a trustee for two different charities. So I understand about how organisations work, how organisations grow, and the importance of organisational integrity, which starts off with people who understand the values of the organisation joining the organisation. So we're at that stage now. There isn't anybody in this room who hasn't joined for pretty much similar reasons. So we've got integrity simply because we're like-minded individuals and the organisation is small enough that we can understand each other. And already we know that there are some differences and there are some things that some doulas treasure that other doulas tolerate them treasuring, but you know what they're like. <laughs> yeah? You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so already there are areas in which we put different emphasis. And as the organisation grows, that will increase and the scope for us not being quite so like-minded will also increase. 
And so one of the things that we need to think about as an organisation and what I wanted to know about before joining up was what's the governance setup look like now and how do you think that that will develop over time? How do you know when a person who's done the doula training has reached the competencies? Because arriving to do the training and leaving at the end of the training is not the same as translating it into practice. And so those are the sorts of things that we talked about over an hour. We talked about it when I was in a cottage in the north of Northumberland where the only telephone signal was up in the attic leaning out of a window. <laughs> so there was, a, there was a kind of 500 way conversation which was Hermione, Ali, Lizzie, me and 496 sheep. <laughs> um, but we got there, didn't we? We managed, we managed to fight our way through and at the end of it, I... I had to resist quite early on just saying, yes, I'll do it, because I could just hear that these people were my tribe and that you people are my tribe. And actually, I get what it is that you're going for and absolutely, it's, it's an honour to champion what it is that you're trying to do. So at the end of the conversation, I said, well, should we, should we give it a go and see how it goes? Um, and we needed to also have a little think about what will we do, how will we signal if it doesn't seem to be a good match as a work in progress. So you're not stuck with me forever. If I start to go off piste and it doesn't match anymore, then there are people whose job it is to tell me that and to give me the choice of matching up or marching off. And likewise, if the organisation starts to charge off in a different direction, I might have to think about that too. I don't foresee that happening, but just, you know, for transparency. So, so what does a patron do? Well, I had to look that up as well. Because um, one of the charities that I'm a trustee of, the patrons are Ant and Deck. <laughs> don't go there. Um, Alan Shearer and Bobby Robson. Now, Bobby Robson, you might have noticed, is dead. And I wasn't prepared to do that for end of life in the UK. Um, so I had to do some thinking about what, what, what does a patron do. So a patron's job really is to promote the organisation and to avoid disgracing you as much as possible. That, that is the job. Um, and that's not going to be a problem, is it? Because what I want to do is raise issues that you're interested in, that I'm interested in. And um, my angel card the first time round was synergy. <laughs> So what I'm doing is schmoozing at schmooze fests that are set up by my publisher who wants me to sell lots and lots of books. And it gives me an audience of people who I can tell about end of life doula, which is absolutely fantastic. So there's lots and lots of synergy happening and a publisher is paying for it to happen. <laughs> Edit that off. <laughs> <laughs> so the sorts of things that are happening are mainly about the book promotion work. So I've become a person who goes to book festivals. Now, I used to be a person who went to book festivals and bought books, and now I'm a person who goes to book festivals and signs books. <laughs> and it's astonishing. And I went to the Hay Festival, which was just such an honour. So I spent three days just looking around and going, it's the Hay Festival! <laughs> and crying because I was just so overwhelmed by it all. Um, but they give you a minder at Hay, because it's so big, you have a minder. Um, and I had this really lovely uh, Welsh student, and he had to um, take me to have my hair and my makeup sorted out. Um, and then he had to make sure that I got to the right place at the right time. Um, and a really important thing that he had to do was liaise with the minder of another writer who I wanted to sign a book for my daughter. <laughs> Um, who was Jacqueline Wilson, who was the children's <laughs> laureate. Um, and she doesn't sign books because the queues get too long and they just get in the way. And in fact, she's so famous that she doesn't even walk across the book festival site because she can't move for being mobbed. I, I just haven't had that problem. You won't be surprised to hear. She gets picked up by a little golf buggy and taken all the way around the fields to the other side to her theatre where she can speak. Um, so... At book festivals, um, people come along, doulas come along, people say hello. 
and that's absolutely fantastic. So some of you I've met at, at book signings. I, ha I now know what podcasts are, and I didn't used to know what podcasts were. And one of the uh, really important ones for me is a podcast that's run by younger people with cancer called You, Me, Big C, and some of you may know about it. Um, and two days ago was the anniversary of the death of Rachel Bland, who was the uh, BBC journalist who started the podcast with two other young women. Um, and they have been absolutely fantastic. They have taken me to their hearts. They originally saw a little video that I made, then they read the book, then they invited me on to speak on the podcast. Uh, they post things, they, sh they tell people about the book. And that's fantastic. And so when I was speaking on their podcast, I was able to talk about the doulas again. So we're getting a big platform. <laughs> it's, it's really fantastic. Um, lots of championing for end-of-life care around uh, the NHS and palliative care conferences. And they are intrigued by the doulas. And it's really interesting trying to explain <laughs> to people who started off in the charitable sector challenging the National Health Service and who have now become mainstream that actually the doula movement doesn't really want to sit in either of those particular places. It wants to be able to weave its way wherever the patient happens to be amongst those places. And I think that's going to be a real challenge for us as, as time goes forward and as resources are, are more and more nipped uh, in health and social care. But I'm, do I'm doing my best. And then, as a, a poacher, I turned gamekeeper and I went to train some CQC inspectors. And I'm really sorry, and I promise I'll eat spinach for the rest of my life <laughs> to make up for that. <laughs> it does need to be done. They need not to criticise only bad practice. They need to celebrate good practice. And they didn't know what good practice looked like. So actually, it was a really wonderful opportunity get along CQC inspectors and tell them the sorts of things that they need to look for to put in their reports to celebrate good practice to encourage other people and then some very posh people then started inviting me to go along because once your book's been in the Sunday Times on the bestseller list <laughs> um, then then people think that you might have something to say so I'm saying at the Academy of Medical Sciences and the National Association for Palliative Medicine and all these different places. The same thing, basically, that I've been saying to consultants in the hospitals where I've worked for the last 20 years. But now, because I've written a book, everybody's listening. Not fair, but that's the way it works. So in each of these places and all of these podcasts, I've been able to find ways of just either pointing out the, the pin, or I didn't take the pin to New Zealand in case I lost it. Um, in fact, doulering in the Antipodes is also happening. Actually, a couple of soul midwives came along to a couple of the talks that I gave, um, and I was asked to explain what a soul midwife was, so I explained what a doula was. And then we had our conference in March, and it was fantastic, and I was just back from New Zealand. I was still completely jet-lagged, forgot my pin and had to be given a spare one for the day, but this is, this is the original now. So... Over the last year, I've been having such a fantastic time, but in all these different places, I've been able to find people in the hospice sector, the voluntary <coughs> sector, social care, health care, <coughs> publishing industry, podcasts, all these different places where you can say, and of course, I'm not the only person who's trying to take back dying and demedicalize it and make it back into a human experience. There is this organisation, Living Well, Dying Well training doulas end of life doula uk and you can look them up and you can go on their website and the website's so fantastic now it's really wonderful to be able to point people at it so well well done website masters it's fantastic so i've met several of you but part of the problem i've got is that on twitter everybody's got stupid names <laughs> so you know i didn't realize that you weren't supposed to call yourself by your name on twitter <laughs> so i'm rather originally called at Dr. Catherine Mannix. Um, so, Featherfoot Doula. <laughs> all right. Spent all evening with her. Didn't know who she was. See, it's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Is this the Is that So, lots of social media pals, lots of different places. 
and and it's just been really really lovely and so everybody who's spoken to me on facebook or, or twitter or sent me emails or written to my agent or all the other different ways people have got in touch thank you so much it's just it's just so lovely so lovely so what are we about then if i'm going to be championing you you better make sure that i've got the script <laughs> right so I think this is what we're about. And if you think it's not what we're about, then you need to tell me so that I say it properly for you. I think that we're about doing death differently in lots of different ways. And perhaps the most provocative of those is that we name it, that we actually use the D words and we use them in the same tone of voice that we use for ordering vegetables. Okay, we don't have special death voice. <laughs> And you've all, you've all met people who've got a deaf voice, haven't you? Yes, and, and one of the things about having somebody who's going to hold the space in calmness is that their voice doesn't change as they're holding the space in calmness. That's one of the things that we do. We might be paddling like mad underneath, but what comes out of our mouths remains calm and, and centred and grounded. And what we're doing is modelling. We're modelling how to discuss death and dying when we run death cafes and we run local events and we uh, do taster days. We're modelling how to be with dying people when we attend outpatient appointments with them, when we go to their radiotherapy planning sessions with them, when we go along with them to talk to their solicitors, when we're with them in their homes, when we're sitting with them whilst they're talking to their families. We're modelling to the families, to the solicitors, to the doctors, to the nurses a way of being that people are not taught in their professional training. You cannot graduate from a British medical school without at least witnessing the birth of a baby. I used to have to, when I qualified, we had to actually deliver babies. You are not required to witness any deaths to graduate as a doctor. And I think that it's not that different for nursing either. So we, we need to be modelling these things. And really what we're doing is we're trying to reclaim the wisdom that's been lost on public understanding of dying. We're not doing something new. We're doing something really, really old. But we're just reminding everybody what it is so that people can talk about it, so people can think about it, and so they can think about what it is they want to do with this precious, precious time that's left, whether it's, sh whether it's days, whether it's weeks, whether it's months. So we're enabling people to think about their goals and to accomplish some of them. And we're not just about happy, gorgeous marvellousness. That actually we are amongst people who are very sad, who are angry, who are afraid, who are suffering. And I think the thing that turns pain into suffering is something that's emotional, spiritual, existential. It's not about the quality of the pain. It's about the quality of experiencing what the pain means. And what we're doing is holding a safe space for people to process their suffering. And many of them, by processing it, will be able to make enough sense of it to be able to live outside of the pain and still do things that are important to them, despite the fact that they still have symptoms. So what we're actually doing is providing safety we're not stopping people from dying, but we're enabling them to die in a safe way. And we're doing something really important, which is we're raising public expectations about the way we die so that other people, having seen a well-managed death, can say at the next death that they're with, this isn't good enough. This is not OK. Get the doctor here now. Get the district nurse here now. Sort this out now. It doesn't have to be like this. So let's keep challenging and raising expectations. I think it's a really, really important part of what we're doing. But it's not going to be without its challenges. And one of the things is that we still really got to work out the hard brass tacks, what the doula role is and what it isn't. And already we know that it's kind of this, but sometimes it's also a bit of that. And is it okay if it adds a bit of this in? And will it still be that if I don't do this bit? So there's something about identifying what's the core part of a doula's role and how do we enable that role to sit alongside and weave between the current services without being swallowed and managed 
and dematerialized by the statutory services. So we want people to want doulas. We want people to want the competencies and the skills that doulas bring into a family and to a bed at the end of life. And we need people who still can't say, I think my dad might be dying to ask for doulas. So we run the risk that doula becomes another one of the D words. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> so what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Well, we're going to be graceful and we're going to be charming. And we're going to know exactly what it is that we are about. And we're going to be very confident as we smile and don't do something that isn't ours to do. We're going to know what the boundaries are and we're going to work them flexibly. But we're not going to work them so flexibly that the social care and the healthcare people can say, well, I'll just leave all of that with you then. And yet there are occasions when that's exactly what we want them to do because when they're in the room, everything is so much worse. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we need to know what we're about. We need to be really clear. And then we need to police those boundaries in such a graceful way that people actually haven't even realised that we've said no. And many of us are already very good at that in other domains in our lives. So it's a transferable skill set. We need to know what it is that we're offering. We need to know what the skill set is. So we need a competency framework. We need a kind of list that describes what a fully competent doula is properly trained to do and what sort of supervision or mentoring it takes to enable us to remain well and competent in those parts of the role. And we need to be responding, not just as an organisation, but as individuals. Each of us can go out and represent better dying to our own families, to our own communities. We can set up different ways of getting the message out there, and there have been workshops about that during the gathering, so that we are able to become role models, not just at the bedsides of the people with whom we're contracting as doulas, but actually as kind of little, little seed crystals back in our own areas of the country as well. So I think that the village model is a really important model and I've always talked about the people who a patient voluntarily assembles around himself or herself as their village. They're not necessarily the same thing as a family. And then when I went to New Zealand, I learnt a new word, and the word is... Fanu. 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 <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it's Fanu. Which is the village around a person, their relatives and their extended family and the people who we choose to be our important people around us. Am I defining this properly? And that is the organisation, that is the structure that we came from, that raised us, the village that raised us. And I think it takes a village to do all the really important things that humanity is about. When we are parenting and we can't remember which way is up, there is a village that supports us. When we are starting to lose our faculties and no longer fully able to be autonomous. It takes our village to cherish us. We are being members of that village when we walk alongside the sick and it takes a village, I believe, to enable safe dying. So we're part of the village's wisdom. Sometimes we're the people who are doing it. Sometimes we're just the people who are saying, yeah, yeah, you can do this. You can do this. You're okay. So what we're doing is we're holding space. It's for all because dying is awesome and it's for healing because actually at the end of life we come full circle and we've all seen amazing healing, haven't we, at the very edge of death. It's a great, great honour to be your patron. You'll have to not mind that I'm a bit of a whingy patron. I managed to get to the penultimate slide before I started leaking today, so that's pretty good for me. <laughs> 
Um, there's been a lot of stuff on social media about tears on public transport for people reading the book. I'm not sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>